Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts Real Estate Podcast. My name is Joe Bauer and I'm here with my co-host, Julie Clark. Julie, how are you doing today? What's up, Joseph and Carl? I am doing good. I have to tell you guys, I, you know, I'm old, right? I'm getting older. You know, I'm Danish, so I still got the young skin. I look like a baby, but I'm feeling older. Metabolism, I think I said it before, starting to mess with me. So I got this secret, can you see it? Secret drink, can you see this? It it's looks secret. It's, it is, uh, it is, it is such an energy booster as well as a metabolism booster. And it is, I'm going to tell you what it is before, because we are going to kick this off with a little bit of health this morning. It is honey, ginger, lemon, a pinch of cayenne pepper and a pinch of cinnamon mm. and like four ounces, three and a half ounces of just hot water. And it sounds disgusting. And trust me, the first time you have it, it is slightly disgusting, but I've now become addicted to it. I like crave it. And it's like a major energy boost and a good metabolism boost. So you guys are in trouble because so, I got my get better project and my big boost of energy here. So, so the real question, are you shaving the ginger or are you, or are you using ginger powder? I am chopping it and I have nice. little chunks of ginger in there. Oh, I love it. Yeah. That's perfect. That's the, yeah. that's the right way to do it. I am because I'm too lazy. I feel like that's the fastest or something like that. But speaking of health, we're just it's spring, guys. It's summer. We're all energized. You guys are stuck with me on overdrive today. So we got the Get Better Project that I want you guys to remind you guys about that my partner, Joe Bauer, is uh, the founder who can kick your butt upside and down if you want to get healthy. Tell us what it is and how everybody can find out briefly, Joe. Sure. Yeah. The Get Better Project is our online at home training program that doesn't require any equipment all the way up to if you got a full stacked up home gym. And we have people that are 72 years old, young, all the way down to those old people at like 28, I think is our, our youngest, actual youngest. And uh, we have coaches as myself that work with people as often as you need it. And then even coaches that are much older in the 68 plus age group that can help out anybody in between. Right now, we're actually in a daily burpee challenge. So if anybody wants to get started in on that, that's a, yeah. uh, a fun way to kick up the summer um, with as many burpees as you would like to do. And you can head over to thegetbetterproject.com and check us out. We have two free weeks always. Swag. And uh, we can work with swag. you on nutrition, fitness, whatever you need. Well, Joe, what's your claim to fame? Don't you have like a claim to fame in regards to your training program? Related well, to somebody that you know very well. Yeah. So we currently train the fittest 65 plus year old in the world, um, who is actually my mother. Yeah. So that's cool. Uh, she won the the title last year at the CrossFit Games and is trying to recapture that again this year. Right now, she's going through the process. She's currently ranked eighth in the world right now for this year wow. and wow. headed into two more competitions. Super awesome. You guys don't even know the gold that you haven't, you know, if you haven't tapped into Joe and your health and fitness, I know you guys want to have all your freedom, make all your money, but you got to have your health. So there you go. You got this guy right here. And, and whether you didn't realize it or not, you got it right here, right for the taking. So speaking of it, let's keep going here. You guys ready to kick this off today? We've got Carl, I'm going to say it, cross cough. Carl Kroskoff is a Seattle-based real estate developer, and he's the managing partner of Aurora's Investment Group. I'm reading off your thing here, Carl. Obsessed with growth, he flipped himself out of a corporate job and, uh, in the healthcare industry and now is now focused on helping others make their money work extremely hard through townhome construction and adding value to operational apartments. What's up, Carl? What's going on now? Appreciate you guys We've been having trying me on to get here. you on here for a while, so this is a special day. Yeah, I, I appreciate you guys helping uh, work with me on the reschedule. COVID uh, shut me down for surprisingly only two and a half days, but I think that the worst part about it was this lingering brain fog for about a week afterwards. Was you know, to me and, and, and anybody else that's listening, that's an entrepreneur, you know, when your brain doesn't work at full capacity, you feel like you're handicapped and you're using crutches. And it's just, it was an awful feeling. You know, there were, there were a couple of conversations I had with brokers during that period. And I just had to back up and, and apologize because I, I was there talking and completely lost my train of thought. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was rough, but you know, week and a half completely uh, recovered, no brain fog, or at least, uh, you know, kind of some of the natural brain fog that comes uh, with age. But 
No, uh, happy to be here. I appreciate you guys having me. Awesome. Well, we're, we are super excited and we are going to jump into it so we can get going and learn as much as we can about you and your business, what you're up to. Yeah. You, you know, before we do that, if you don't mind, I, I, I just would love to shout out to Joe and uh, uh, Joe, your mom, right? Uh, Patty? Yeah. Um, on on that that's that's extreme so i i just started uh, crossfit about a year ago and, and started getting into it and looking forward to some of the competitions but you know by nice. uh, no means necessary my you know going to be uh, or be near anything from a patty standpoint um so i, I actually look forward to getting into uh, the get better project myself and uh, um, just add add a little bit of extra exercise to the day and uh, you know I, every morning it's a morning routine for me and nice. yeah, so i think that we can certainly add something either in the afternoons or evenings cool that's awesome thank you appreciate that yeah of course well there we go guys a new bromance has started right before your eyes <laughs> well yeah. let's go joe we'll give you the honor of kicking us off today yeah carl we want to know as much about you as we can in this small period of time that we get to talk to you. So if you could step back in time and tell us how you grew up, where you grew up, and how that led you with as much detail as you'd like to share to where you sure. are today. Sure. Absolutely. So I grew up as a beach bum uh, surfing in uh, the East Coast of Florida. You know, all I did uh, for the about 20 years of my life on the front end, uh, you know, went to school, got got a college degree, uh, surfed a lot, and just really enjoyed life. Kind of took it took it slow, finished up my MBA uh, pretty quickly after my undergrad uh, and uh, work transferred me out to to Texas, which I don't know if you've ever lived in Texas, but you know, living in Dallas was just a, a concrete jungle for us. We, we spent all of our disposable income leaving the state. After about a year, we spent, uh, we spent about four years there and moved out to Seattle, uh, truly for the love of the mountains. Absolutely love backpacking, hiking, doing anything outdoors, snowboarding, kayaking, everything. And, uh, you know, really fell in love uh, with Seattle, the things that Seattle had to offer from an accessibility standpoint to outdoors. And uh, we decided to move out, still worked my remote job, which was great at the time. Uh, uh, again, working in the healthcare space as a corporate, uh, corporate development and business strategy uh, director. Moved out to Seattle, didn't have anybody that I was working with locally, and just flew in and out of Encino, which was Los Angeles, Dallas, all over the country. You know, after about two years of living here in Seattle, you know, I think that the biggest thing, two big things that drove me into the real estate space, and specifically on the education side, is a the the right the, the cost of live living here in Seattle was was atrocious. I was working on a uh, Dallas based salary, so cost of living in Dallas, far lower than Seattle. And then we were also deciding to have a kid. So what better time to start a, a business mm-hmm. on the side than when you decide to have a kid? So I, I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment, I suppose. We uh, spent about six months self-educating podcasts, books, uh, anything, and every, anything and everything that we can get uh, our hands on to. My wife and I spent six months, bought my first duplex, Thought I was going to burr it, uh, buy rent, buy rehab rent, refinance. Come to find out, there was no way I could. I bought retail. I was mis- somewhat misled uh, on uh, the the broker side, but also I did not do my level of due diligence. So it's always my fault, always my responsibility. Was not able to burr it. Had to figure out how to get my capital back. Started uh, and did my first flip uh, up in Everett, which is just north of Seattle. Did an incredible job and uh, turned that. Pro- those profits into three new flips. Those did pretty well. One of which was actually a, uh, I was a victim of an identity theft crime on one of those properties. Happy mm. to share that story if you'd like to hear it. Yeah. And uh, kept going from there, right? So uh, two of those properties ended up making relatively good uh, profit and started networking, started meeting with other people and uh, just kept growing the business from the flip side of things. It's been about a year that I've been full-time now. So Absolutely love it. Love the flexibility. I uh, love the flexibility that uh, this life, this uh, kind of this business has to offer. Uh, one thing uh, to mention that I didn't realize is yes, flexibility, but also the amount of work is, I would say, doubled from my corporate job, right? Running a business <laughs> yeah. is, is, is far different. You're on 24 7 every, every day of the week. And it's not because I need to, it's because I love it. And that's just the way that it works. Well, they do say flipping is just as a day job, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's taxed yeah. like a day job. It's a day job. 
I think people flip as they get started and then they graduate into realizing they need to hold some properties or yep. get into the development, which is again, a lot of work. Good for you. So you were part-time how long before you went full-time? I was part-time for two years, right? As I started on the flipping side of things was when my daughter was born. So I spent two years growing the business, growing it into a business all while, you know, obviously being at home with my kid, uh, working my corporate job. Wow. So how many, how many, you know, you, you're in development now you like right. and for doing development. How many homes did you flip before you jumped into development? Cause I we, feel like you made the move pretty fast. I mean, yeah. a lot of other people, you know, even to this day, um, I think some of the big flippers that I know have barely started only maybe out of being forced to do so and, and watching a few of the other people around town here start to do so start sure. getting into develop or even holding properties and buying yeah. rentals. So, uh, Again, two years of flipping. Uh, I flipped, I want to say it was four homes the first year, six homes the second year. And then, uh, of course, this is during the corporate job. Uh, last year, I did uh, three flips, but bought and in, moved into 11 town. Yes, 11 town homes, building 11 town homes and a detached ADU as well. Nice, nice. Wow. Okay, so what what are you working on right now? The eleven townhomes and yep. So uh, uh, six of those are sold, and we close on all six of them this month. By the end of this month, which is fantastic. Uh, five are in rough end stages right now, so we look at probably getting those sold in August or September. Uh, Dad, do detached ADU, you um, backyard cottage, whatever you want to call it, is being listed uh, this month as well. Where's that? Uh, North Seattle. So every every good good question. So everything that I'm doing that we've got right now going on is all based in Seattle. The million and a half, two million dollar homes over on the east side. Uh, you know, if we have to hold those, our experience is that there is a there is a chance. There's a larger chance on the east side where rents don't necessarily cover the debt service and yield as much cash flow as something that might happen from a, uh, where we're looking at both density as well as affordability on the on the west side, which being in, in Seattle. So all of our projects have been in Seattle for that reason. Gotcha. Also, uh, we understand, I understand the the zoning, the codes, all that kind of stuff a lot better. Awesome stuff. Did you, did you have fear when you, I mean, how did you, you know, you flipped, I don't know, 10 homes or however many more. Did you have some fear to make the move towards development or did you partner with somebody that had experience. So you weren't sort of flailing out there on your own for the first, this is your 11 units of the first development deal then? Yeah. Or the, uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. There was, there was a great deal of fear, right? It's, it's leaving a a job where I was, you know, getting paid about 125,000 bucks a year, incredibly, uh, what's the word? Predictable cash, which was nice. To a position where you know, a I knew I was flipping. Uh, I had quite a bit of projects in the pipeline. B I knew I was get, I had already gotten into the development. One of the de- one of the two developments. You know, I think the the biggest fear was okay. I've I've I no longer get paychecks every two weeks right now, right? It I only get I'm, from a flipping and development standpoint. I'm only getting uh, paychecks when we liquidate, which is which you know when those paychecks come, they're significantly larger. But you know, from a, a timing perspective, I wasn't going to be getting anything for at that point three months, five months. Yeah, that was that was worrisome. That was fearful. But absolutely, you look at the, your you look at your time, how you're spending your time. Uh, you know, at that point, I, I could certainly say that the flipping business was was making me as much as much money uh, as the corporate job at that point. And I knew if I took and spent, you know, even just six more hours a day on the on my business, how much more money uh, and wealth we could be creating uh, than just what I was able to focus on, uh, you know, for let's say let's call four hours a day. How did you get that, or find, or get involved in that first uh, develop? Was the first development deal the the Dadu type of situation, or was it the townhomes? No, it was the townhomes. So it was six townhomes. Got into that by. uh, uh, you had mentioned partnering, so I got into that by partnering up with a, a builder, a local builder here. We, we got this property brought to us by Thatch. That's when who, if you're in the market, if you're on anything on social media, you know you know who he is. We we bought the property from him, uh, and it was permit ready, which is great. Uh, allowed us to get in, uh, break ground uh, within about a week, or t- I think we were, I think we were one week after closing uh, on the purchase that we 
had excavators out and we were starting to tear up the ground. So it was pretty quick. Okay, so you bought a permit ready yep. uh, site. Okay. Well, that's, that took some hair out of it and some time out of it for yeah. you. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what the two, the two townhome projects that we bought last year were. And while they're fantastic, they have some really, really great velocity of money, right? We can get in, get investor money in and uh, operate and close it out within a, you know, conservatively within a 15 month period, aggressively within a 12 month period, I would say. Could. Well, let's take, take us through that timeline. What yeah. is that timeline? So it's already permitted. Your construction permit has been issued or about as can be issued yep. at any time. And so it's shovel ready as we yep. call it. Right. Yep. And so what's the timeline when you buy, you know, lots of people avoid buying buying those types of projects. They want to do the permitting and the entitlements because there's some value add there, obviously, sure. right? There's a big, but maybe when you're first getting started to get some deals under your belt and development, yep. there's more availability right. potentially of those deals. Maybe you don't make as much money, but you don't take as much risk. Tell us about that and how you thought, you thought, you know, rather than go out and get your own dirt and do the whole thing, you know, this is bringing up a great point. And then tell us the timeline of when you buy a shovel ready deal, what that looks like. Sure. So, so there's a, a lot of questions in there. I'm going to try and answer them all from a timing perspective. Uh, right. We're buying shovel ready. Uh, and the idea is to get your land moving uh, within a week or two from actually closing on the property, closing on the purchase. You know, from there, it's again, you're looking, we, we were shooting for a 10 month finish on construction. In order to in order to get to that twelve month period, twelve. How months, many units? Six. Okay. And uh, we were there until one of the the public utility companies came in and said, "Yeah, no, you can't go overhead. Uh, we're going to make you go underground. Uh, and instead of tapping into the current transformer, you're going to have to upgrade the transformer." Ouch. Yep. So that unfortunately added two and a half months into on the construction side because we got tied up in engineering. We got tied up in actually going underground and bringing in these massive precast concrete uh, boxes where the underground transformer uh, resides and uh, quite a bit of money. So yeah, what was the cost to switch? Uh, it was about 98,000. Oh, yeah, it's not a fun one. So that's like what profit off one unit or you one know, and a half? Yeah, so it's it's a good point. You know, the the thing with on the development side is you and everybody know uh, knows you know cost of materials went absolutely bananas this last two years, one to two years. We were absolutely stuck right in the crosshairs of the lumber, so we we ended up purchasing our lumber package for the six townhomes right when the lumber prices were at their very highest. Yeah. So you but, got slapped on the lumber, you got yeah. slapped on the electrical. Everything else was relatively on, on par, which was great. And so, uh, you know, what we we were blessed, lucky, whatever you want to call it, with the market appreciation. So right. m- market did appreciate fairly well. We did, uh, I'll say, extremely well from a uh, appreciation standpoint. I would also say it's not just pure appreciation. I would say it's conservative underwriting on on our part, right? So we. Whenever we look at developments, one of the big one of the biggest things that we probably do differently than uh, some of the other developers is uh, we're not baking any appreciation into uh, the sales prices. So whenever we look at when whenever we underwrite any kind of development deal, we're looking at what were the sales comparables from the last three months, last six months on something like this, and that's where we base our underwriting. So Are that you way, in a situation like that, though, where the others might be baking it in. A little appreciation. How do we compete? How do you compete to even purchase the deal then? Or is yeah, it a relationship? It's 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 relationship. It's knowing that we can actually close. And then I would say it goes to uh, probably that we're getting passed up and we're passing up on a lot of opportunities because our numbers just aren't matching. Yeah. And so that's you know that's that's certainly a challenge, but that's also what is driving us to. Uh, buying our own land and, and doing the entitlements and the permitting ourselves. So that way we can, A, as you mentioned earlier, add value via the entitlement process. But also that way, we're not necessarily needing to uh, compete as aggressively with other other buyers in that mid-market cycle. 
Hey guys, it's Julie here with a quick break from the show to discuss an opportunity some of you may have interest in, which is to work more closely with me. On almost a daily basis, I get calls from investors and brokers, both new and experienced, asking me for guidance or advice. I love helping you guys out and it keeps me on my toes too. So with that said, I wanted to let you know that I have a private broker coaching community called the VIP Education Community. And the best part is that it's 100% free. That's right. It's free to join. So whether you're a traditional broker or a broker investor, my VIP education community offers personalized one-on-one coaching from not just me, but also from my experienced broker friends with expertise in all disciplines of real estate and real estate investing. We'll teach and share our modern marketing strategies, our tech and lead generation resources, plus teach you how to identify or offer up opportunities for yourself or for your clients using techniques such as seller financing, lease options, land entitlement deals, burr investing, flipping, multifamily or commercial coaching, whatever you like, we've got it all covered for you. The future of real estate is changing fast and to stay in the game, it's time to learn about all the options you can offer your buyer and seller clients, as well as if you want, learn how to use those skills to grow your own real estate portfolio. If you'd like more details about joining my VIP education community, reach out to me at julie at seattleinvestorsclub.com or text me at 206-910-2985 or just send me a Facebook message. My new favorite phrase is community equals confidence. So let's navigate the future of real estate together. Now back to the show. Do you think there's any, I mean, this could be a stupid question, but do you think there's any sense in in your first deal or two, being willing to take less profit as long as you're not going to hurt yourself and you can survive with your family to get a couple under your belt because then lenders, private money people, yep. you know, other brokers and wholesalers take you more seriously and bring you more deals. What do you think about that? I mean, you can't hurt yourself. It's like a double-edged short sword. Yeah, I, I would say absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, go in. Uh, expecting somewhat less profit, right? But it, it's not like yeah, there's been a couple flippers that I've helped mentor in the past that, you know, they were wanting to get into their first flip and they said, you know what, if I break even, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy because it's a learning experience, which I completely agree. But with that, with it's a learning experience, but I completely disagree with the goal of going in and putting in, you know, some of this, if you're general contracting yourself, you're putting in you know, towards the end, 30, 40 hours of work per week. And it's, it's insane. And to go in with the mindset of, no, I'm, I'm, I just want to break even. I, I, I couldn't disagree with that anymore. I couldn't disagree with that more. So, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's where do you want to be from a profitability standpoint? Notch, notch that down by a couple points, right? Maybe two to three points. If you're looking at a 15% margin, right? Go down to 10 don't go below that because otherwise things happen. Contingencies. Me, go ahead. Does the bank, I don't know how you finance the deal, but does a, does a lender want to see a 20%, you know, whenever I deal with other builders and stuff like that, when I'm looking at deals, I'm trying to hit that, you know, underwriting number of a 20% return minimum for financing reasons for the builder or for whoever. Is that a threshold yeah. that you keep in mind? Um, I mean, I guess it would depend on the, on the lender. You know, yeah. typically our lend the lenders that we work with, which has been legacy capital, primarily on the on the ground up construction, they're wanting to see things that. In sorry if I'm uh, dropping some names, but uh, no, they, they've no. been great. Really love them. Based out of Bellevue, you know, one of the numbers that they uh, and I, I believe a lot of the other lenders are looking at is they're wanting to lend no higher than a sixty five percent loan to value. Now it's you know typically when you're talking about ground up, you're talking about loan to cost, but you know, they're also weighing the exit value as well. So loan to value. So are they doing like a 75, 80% loan to cost, then benchmark by a 65% ARV on your gross sure. sales price? Uh, so it's it the, the, the ranges will typically be, and again, it's dependent upon experience, 85% uh, loan to cost, and then down to a 65 or rather up to 65% loan to value on whatever your exit value or ARV is. On your gross sales right. number. So six right. times, however, whatever the price is. Right. Times 65% is the benchmark yep. versus the 85% loan to all costs. Yep. 
That's that's the same as bridge financing, guys. Like if you're doing an apartment development and you're doing a value add on an apartment building, same type of metrics, except for if you b- go below, you know, the cash flow or the certain coverage, your credit has to carry the shortfall. Right. So how does that work in regards to the financing on development in regards to your ability to carry payments or do you have an interest, interest reserve, reserve built into the... Interest reserve typically. Uh, and, it, and again, it depends on the lender. But a lot of the lenders that we've worked with are, uh, you know, we're looking to get into the bank, some of the soft money as well. Softer, I should say, softer money as well. Typically on the ground up construction, uh, interest reserves is certainly an option, which, you know, we do like because on our projects, we go in, obviously somebody has to pay, somebody has to bring in equity. And so what we're doing is we're working with our investors to bring in some of the equity uh, cash down, uh, you know, depending on the loan type, we'll either have to a raise the capital from a interest reserves perspective, or rather a, a monthly payment perspective, or, you know, again, depending on the loan product, we're able to tie in, bring in interest reser- reserves as well. So when you're working with investors, you're looking for your down payment money and your potential interest reserve money. Do they require a cash reserves in addition to that? We typically bring in uh, cash reserves as well, operating reserves. And it, it depends on the project, depends on the risk, right? Or depends on how we're operating it, right? If it's an apartment, it's typically you know 5% of uh, whatever we're bringing down. Or if it's a construction project, we'll bring in 10% of the total project costs. So that way, again, we've got extra res- reserves, which just gives us more flexibility from a, a spending perspective during the construction phase. So how much in, uh, in regards to your six unit, which is now, it sounds like 11, what, how much did you have to raise for that, for your equity? What was your equity requirement? Sure. So we ended up raising, I, I want to say it was 700 and then 800,000 respectively. So 700 on the six unit and then eight, 800 on the five uh, five units up in Ballard. And cost difference is a couple of things. A, the cost of the land was significantly different between the two properties. One, uh, the six units was South South Seattle, Rainier Beach, and then uh, the five units was Ballard uh, in the heart of Ballard. So land cost was radically different. And then the construction mechanism or the con- the actual construction of the units was radically different. Our Ballard projects are actually uh, four floors plus a rooftop deck. So uh, cost of materials, specifically lumber, were even though it was fewer units, it was actually a higher price. And did you uh, now what what are you is I don't even know if this is an an, a question that can be answered but in general what would you use these days for construction costs if you're just on the back of a napkin sure. those are the best deals guys you do it on the back of a napkin you can underwrite it real quick those are the good deals what are you using for your benchmarks for construction costs these days sure. like in Ballard yeah that's a so Ballard the Ballard project is a little bit different because the uh, units unit sizes were a lot smaller Right, they're about a thousand to eleven hundred, okay. and then there were four floors, which is not common at all. Ballard was a little bit different. We look, we're probably going to be anywhere from three hundred to three hundred and ten dollars per square foot on those, okay. which would is covering uh, horizontal costs, land costs, utilities, any kind of street improvements, and it, we are hiring a general. We hire a general contractor for this, okay, and it includes the fee bill for the general contractor. Okay, what about the other one? Uh, the other one, I believe we're going to net out around 250, 255 okay. again for the same things. Yeah. And so if somebody brought you a deal, I guess if it was in North Seattle versus Ballard, you're going to use different numbers, right? I mean, but it, it again, I, I would say it would go back to uh, the unit sizes, the average unit size, the lot, right? Is it hyper infill or do we have some storage, uh, some storage space? And then, uh, what is the actual makeup, right? Are they, uh, I, I said unit size, but what does the actual construction look like? Four story, three story, everything is a party wall, which means we're going to need a lot of dense glass. You know, typically I'll, I'll go in assuming it's around the 300 uh, benchmark yep. and then ratchet it down uh, based on uh, reviewing the construction set plan. Yeah. What kind of profit margin do you think that? that the average Joe is looking for on, I, I think Augie, I remember, I think he was talking to me about, we were talking about something one time and he was baking in like 125 grand a unit. I don't know that if that's 
foggy steep number or if that's a good number or yeah it that's a that's a that's a that's a very, I would say that's a very healthy number obviously you know Augie for maybe some of the, I don't know how, how many folks do or don't know him but Augie Bukowski is a a lend a mortgage broker excuse me an insane developer great developer you know shout out to Augie for teaching me uh, everything I know about construction he and I worked on a uh, a flip which was a catalyst to me actually leaving my corporate job so I, I obviously owe a lot to Augie and his, yeah. his wisdom. And we uh, anyway. educate him in the community. Thank you. Yeah, so, Kowski, shout out to you, brother, for educating people. We appreciate that. The the 125, absolutely. That's a healthy number. That's a very safe. That's a very conservative number. And it, I, I would say it also depends on density and volume. So uh, right now we're looking at a cottage portfolio, I'll call it, of about 16 units. So uh, it's it's actually would be a mix where we're going to go in and bring in, uh, if finalize the permits, right? They've already started, they're already in corrections. And so we're going to go in, work with the 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 engineering and the project team and finish up the, the corrections. Something like that, right? Typically, we're looking anywhere from 100 to 110K per door. Something like this, we're K with a little bit lower because- you have more units. The sheer volume, right? Yeah. And I think, we're, I think we're net, net, 95, 90 to 95 per door. So it's yeah. not like we're radically lower. What are the loan terms that you're using when you underwrite today? Are you using like, well, I don't know what type of term for development, mm-hmm. you know, like your loan terms from legacy capital, what, what, what do those terms look like? And what would you underwrite today for your interest? Is that sure. an interest only payment for, you know, 12 months or what, how does that work? Yeah, it, it is an interest only 12 month. Uh, interest only twelve month product. You know, I, I would say that I, I really love and really love uh, loved working with and continue working with Legacy. You know, as we get into some of the bigger projects, we're certainly going to need longer terms, and I think that's the biggest. You know, interest interest rate, interest uh, interest only. You know, those are those are very very important to us. But you know, now it's now we're looking at kind of table stakes. It needs to be eighteen to twenty four months from a construction standpoint because. You know there have been uh, delays in supplies which have impacted our construction, uh, and then moreover, you know this f- the, the municipalities that we've worked with in the past have uh, they're smaller in teams, they're they're leaner, so they're working with less resources, which means again construction delays. So uh, you know I think I think it's ambitious to be uh, fully liquid, fully built and liquidated within a twelve month period. And if you're not in and out in twelve months, then you're you're having to, uh, you know, work in extension fees, which right. are expensive. And so, what are those rates looking like? I mean, are those six, seven percent, or is that higher? I, I think we were at nine, eight, eight, nine, nine, eight point nine nine percent. Eight point nine nine percent for twelve months. Yep. With some extensions baked in there and interest only yep. for 12 months, which sucks. 12 months, right? You, like you said, doesn't work. Then you have some huge extension fee, you know, yep. and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, again, maybe we should have them on. That'd be fun. You could you could join us, actually. You could be my <laughs> co-host if you want. We could maybe get Legacy Capital on the, on the show here. But um, that's all good stuff. So let me ask you then. So we talked about how you financed it. We talked about that you got it from Thatch and you bought a shovel ready site. And that was kind of like your go-to to get some of these deals as you're getting started here. What do you think the biggest learning curve was for you getting started? So you didn't have to worry yet about the entitlement process right. and you just had to get straight to construction. I know a lot of you know times people might not realize that, oh my God, the the water connection is you know 100 yards away, which adds an insane amount of money, or they might re- some drainage thing, or like you yep. said, the underground utility thing, or even paving requirements, or, yep. you know, that the city comes in, what do you, you know, it'd be great to have a checklist of, you know, this is how I got blindsided in the past, I have to check for all these things, due diligence list, what yeah. would you put on there? Oh, the, the list is, is endless. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if you've had uh, Ryan Gibson with Spartan on here. Yep. Or, if, you know, th- they have an ex- absolutely the most extensive due diligence checklist that I've ever seen. And it's fantastic. So shout out to him if you want to go get get that. You know, I know it's available on, on their website, but you know, ours is not not that extensive yet. And that's just because from an experience standpoint, you know, it, our, our list does grow because every single time uh, I feel like we look at it, we, we go into due, due diligence, we learn something new. 
right? And so uh, it, it's been my partner, Chris Bowen, who is hyper detail oriented project management. He's the operational side of things. You know, every time we go through a project, we're we're growing our due diligence checklist because there's things in it that we is you know both both neither of us came from the construction world. Yeah. Both of us came from a corporate job where our actual hands-on construction experience is limited and our uh, experience from a time perspective is also limited in the in the real estate and construction standpoint. So, you know, I would say uh, what's helped us a lot has been uh, trusted partnerships with our general contractor, which, you know, one thing going from flips to developments is, it, you know, it certainly seems like echelon of... Uh, General contractors and contractors is is a bit different, right? Instead of working with you know cash only contractors on the flip side, uh, you know we're able to negotiate better terms, net uh, net thirty terms, things like that with with contractors, general contractors, and subcontractors on the development side. I, I think to to go back and answer your question, what's what's been one of the biggest lessons learned? It's been uh, really being able to build those trusted partnerships with anybody from from a general contractor to an, an attorney to a lender you know really identifying those key uh, team members Players, yeah yeah how about your contract have you, did you did you, have you had to make improvements to your contract because you couldn't give somebody a spanking when you needed to or you know have you gotten burned because of your contracts weren't tight enough yeah um, in the past you know and and let me just say working with builders myself as a broker that I've seen some some builders get spanked a little bit by buyers when they didn't have tight enough sort of builder terms yep. you know or have that totally clear when they go to resell the properties as well so yes and when you build it but also yes when you sell it seems yeah. intuitively easy but costs money and takes work and thought to get it right so yeah the 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 builder warranties are so uh so crucial to make sure that they're they're locked tight and so i think again uh, going back and making sure that you know who you, that you're who you're working with is absolutely critical and that includes right are they collect are, do they collect lien waivers how well do they collect them do they uh, have a builder's warranty how uh, how in detail or in depth is it you know reviewing all of that stuff before you get into uh, a partnership or into rather a contract with with them and so you know on the on our contract side uh, our you know master services agreement which governs the scope of work which governs you know other things from a contract standpoint you know we again originally going into and working in the flip side of things it was a back of the you know as you mentioned back of the napkin type of a, a document and so uh, as i matured as i got b- bigger better as I got more available cash, then it's starting to incorporate attorneys, attorney fees, which are absolutely worth it. Because if I look back, how much money did I lose working with you know, back of the napkin uh, contracts? Because they they had no they, they held no water in, in a court perspective. Do you have an attorney person that you like that you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, uh, happy to. So there, there's there's two I would say. One on the syndication side is three pillars and they're based out of uh, uh i believe it's well it's colorado but they uh, are syndication attorneys nationally so they've worked with us both on on both townhome builds and we'll continue to work with them on on our other um syndications and funds and then from a contract law and uh condominium process is wilson law firm and they're based here in the, the seattle area are you guys doing some condos or can potentially condominium dadus? So we're we're oh, condoizing gotcha. yeah, yeah. single families dadus, but no uh, no high rise, no mid rise condos. Not for this. And then that condos. actually isn't that expensive to do the condo dadu. No, you know. totally what is, worth it. What's the cost on that? Is it ten grand or less, or what less. is it? It's yeah, less like than six that. Yeah. Or something like that. Or I, something. I think we were taxes included somewhere in like the seven thousands. Yeah, not Fantastic. bad. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it it truly gives you as the builder, buy, buyer, seller, you know, what a, owner, let's just call it owner, so much more flexibility because you can, again, you can sell them separately, which is fantastic, either now or later. And uh, I mean, to me, it's it was more than worth it because, you know, when you're building a detached ADU, how big is your buyer pool for, you know, a 700000 to a $1 million home plus 
you know, a 600 to $700,000 dadu, right? Your buyer right. pool's small. You know, you'd know better than I would. Yeah. Right. How, how many people are buying a single families with a dadu on it? Probably not many. They probably would if there were more of them. Right. The, I mean, the price there, you're, you're looking at 1.2 to 1.5 on a, on a, on a purchase price. Whereas yeah. from an affordability standpoint, you know, if you can sell them separately, then not only you as the owner can probably profit more, but from a, a cultural standpoint, you're also able to house two two families instead of you know one with whatever they want to do with the other other property. So so here's the next question: Who'd you rather? That's like a joke, haha. Uh, would you rather do townhomes or you know a single family with a dadu? I mean, obviously there's more there's more volume with the the townhomes. I don't know if the, you know, obviously the profit might be different one way or another. Yeah. I don't know. You tell me. So it, it, it's, uh, of course it depends. You know, the, the nice thing about the Dadu side of things is that we have worked and will continue to work with the city on the pre-approved plans, which our last dat- detached ADU, we went from uh, purchase to breaking ground with permits in hand in five weeks. So uh, we will be in and out of that from uh re- raw land, right? Raw backyard to fully sold in a nine month period. Nice. What's the cost on the dadu? Is that around 300 too? Yeah. I w- so I think our total cost will be about 330, uh, three, about 330. That's soft and hard costs. So uh, financing, holding costs, everything from the permit surveys and condo, all the way through the hard costs. Let's go through the process real quick. Let's sure. say you find an existing house that has a nice side yard or backyard with some access there, and you're going to do a remodel of the front house, and you're going to throw a dadu in the back, which can mean, can it mean, what does that mean? Does that mean 800 or 1,000 square feet? Does it mean one or two you know, units back there? You know, sort of a what does that mean? I guess sure. it means based on the zoning. Let's cover that first, and then I'll so, ask you some more. So I, I would say, uh, from a zoning perspective, I mean, you can you can truly put it on any, I believe, any land, any zoned land, maybe minus like downtown commercial or some of those crazy ones, right? Let's talk about it's single. As long family. as the lot size is large enough, right? I was about to get into that. So uh, typically, the lot size that would make this a project, a product like this sing and work really well is about 6,500. So lot sizes that are single family, uh, low rise, residential, small lot. You know, if you're looking at anything north of 6,500, you can almost guarantee uh, you can put that a uh, data on that thing. Now, the uh, one thing that will, uh, will be a caveat is the placement of the existing home, right? If it's smack dab in the middle, if it's large, uh, it, you know, it, it could, interrupt the buildability of it. What's the setback requirement? Five feet. So with a residential zoned property, you're building one, what is it? 800 or a thousand square feet? Yeah. So it's, it's a thousand square foot, two story, two bed, one and a half bath. It's got a footprint of 554 square feet. So the beautiful thing about that is, and the reason why it's, you know, pre-approved and so quick is because it's under the minimum, uh, or rather under the threshold from a, a, a undisturbed ground perspective. So, uh, you know, once really is really, once you're submitting that permit, you're, you're, you've got it in sub five weeks, easy. And, and you guys can all check on your own properties that you own by going to ADU universe Yep. and you can just put the address in and they'll tell you right there what can fit on there or if you're approved for that or what you're approved. So that's, Single family zoning. Let's go to the RSL zoning that people like Adrian Chu loves, and I'm sure you do too. What would you do with an RSL? What does that allow you to do versus a single family lot? Sure. So, I, I, with I, I would say on the on the RSLs, the big play there is density. So it's going to be uh, cottages, right? Cottages that are range from uh, mid seven mid to upper seven hundreds all the way up to uh, probably a thousand square foot, a thousand and change square feet. So uh, ideally, right. Ideally on those residential small lots, RSL lots is you're able to get in, get four. The number that I like is four, uh, four cottages. How uh, many square, cottages. what size lot do you need for four? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I figured you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I would, I, I believe the one that we're doing right now is 5,000 square feet. Don't quote me on that. 
Adrian, I know, is far smarter than me on on the RSL stuff. Yeah, I would say about five thousand square foot uh, square foot lot. You know, you can pretty easily get a, a four units in there. And are those are those attached or are they detached? They can be either. Again, go, uh, going back to the ones that we're we're working on right now, they are duplex style. So uh, they are. I think one property it's got four, so two uh, two duplexes on it, and the other two lots have uh, three duplexes on them. And the nice okay, thing about lot size, yeah, lot the size, nice setbacks, right? What's the parking requirement for something like that? These are are unparked, so off street. So yeah. you don't have to have a parking spot per unit. Nothing. No. Nope. Does that affect your value though? If you don't, of course, hundred yeah. percent. Right. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> does. You know, our out of our six townhomes, or t- the six townhome project, we had two. We actually it was actually two detached homes and four townhomes. One of the uh, uh, detached homes had a garage, sold highest, and then the next highest uh, price sold was the townhome with a garage on it, right? Even higher than the detached home by, I want to say it was like $35,000, $40,000. Difference. Yeah. Wow. It's, yeah. It's huge. So the, the value of a garage, the value of a parked yeah. unit is huge. But first thing they, when the market crashes, not that that's going to happen, but that when a market takes a dip, the first thing that ends up sitting on the market is homes that don't have a garage. Yeah. That yeah, is from a, automatically I mean, from a storage perspective. The, Back of the bus at that point. Yep. Um, what? So you're condominiumizing the cottages as well. Right. Right. I believe so. I need to double yeah, check. I'll, I'll double check that. Sold, they're being sold as like a townhome, sort of right. like condo. Yeah. Yep. So there has to be some sort of condo HOA thing. Not that it's yeah. some HOA piece, but yeah. Okay. So that's that. And then, of course, when you get to the LR, you might be looking more at a small apartment building or you might be looking at whatever. Yeah, uh, townhomes are are probably the the easiest thing to put in uh, to a uh, LR low rise LR zone property, and uh, we love it. Ta- the the nice thing about the townhomes versus the apartments is the speed of permitting and entitlement. Right, as long as there's nothing ambitious being asked or you know crazy things being done on the property, you can expect townhomes to be permitted and entitled in about a, a twelve month period, and then you have the the twelve mo- more months of construction. Whereas something like an apartment, you're probably looking closer to two to three years on the entitlements and then 18, uh, I would say 18 to 24 months on the construction. Yeah. So, long timelines for yeah. sure. And, and, and right now we're doing that, both. Right yeah. now we're doing both. We're offering on uh, uh, land right now that's low rise. So working towards townhomes and then offering on land that is neighborhood commercial up to 55 feet where we will plan on entitling for uh, mixed use. I need you to connect you with my uh, buddy, Dan Wick, who's... Uh, That'd be great. Uh, yeah. who's He basically specializes, he's a developer that specializes in subdivisions and entitlements and stuff like that. He's, nice. Yeah. He was one of my... Uh, shout out to my brother, Dan. What's up? We're having lunch this week. Um, yeah. And I'll mention his name to you and get you guys connected. He's He's focuses more on, you know, like probably Snohomish County stuff and sure. things like that. So what are the cities now that you can do that where you don't have to do an owner occupied situation? I know Shoreline, you're still doing owner occupied. Yep. Are you focused just on Seattle? Cause I know it doesn't work really well, maybe like in Kirkland, even though they might allow it. So the ones that allow it, I believe right now are Tacoma, Burien, Seattle, and Kirkland. I think those are the yeah. four. Yeah. And the reason we like Seattle so much for the detached ADU play is for the pre approved plans, right? Again, going to the fact that we can go from purchase to entitlements to construction to liquidation in a, in a nine month period. It's hard to beat. How much time as a broker, right? I get uh, property owners coming to me. I think you want to West Seattle right now, I'm talking to you. That has a perfect lot for a, for a dadu to be added. Mm-hmm. What, what, you know, as a homeowner, like if you own one of those lots, would there be some, what's the, how long does it take to get your shovel ready pre-approved? What's the situation if a seller wanted to add some value prior to selling their home and they could go get one of the pre-approved plans, basically shovel ready and ready to go, right? Is there any value in that or what's the cost? I would absolutely say so. So uh, on a, from a soft cost perspective, if a homeowner wanted to do something like this and they didn't even want to build it, right? Let's just say the homeowner wants to go in, get their backyard permitted for something like this. Depends on location, but you could probably sell it 
a, a permit ready Dadu site for anywhere around a hundred thousand. That's a hundred grand. Yep, hundred grand. And the cost for that is, you know, let's forget about how long it takes, but the cost yeah. for that is probably going to be, uh, it will, it would be certainly less than 25,000, uh, probably more like 20,000. And that's surveys, topo survey, uh, boundary survey, uh, your condo survey, uh, your permits, as well as the architect fee and your condominium documents. Say that again. So you need your survey, a topo, you need your boundary line survey. Yep. Boundary line, topo uh, survey, topographical survey, uh, condo your, docs. Yep. Well, I, I would, not I would, necessarily. Uh, Somebody uh, else is going to do that. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, no. No. You'd have to have the condominium because established. Yes, you'd have you'd have to have the condo process started because uh, you can't sell you can't sell a portion. I mean, I guess you could sell a portion of your property se- separately, but. What the condominium does is it creates the two separate tax parcels. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I, I think that that would absolutely be the easier way to go. And again, given it's a seven grand charge, relatively minimal. Right. And then lastly is the architect and the permits. Yeah. I mean, that's worth it. Absolutely. I mean, somebody, if you guys, whoever wants to get in that business, like should be in the business of you, you could actually start a business where you fund that 25000 yeah. You know, you got all these concierge services. You heard it here, guys. Get better project. This is my new business idea. If you want to work out with me on it, give me a call. Literally, you could be a lender, just like concierge type lender yep. to homeowners who, you know, you spot the 25 and you sp- you get your 25 back plus another 25 and they make an extra 50. God, it'd be, it'd be great for them doing nothing with no cash right. out of pocket. What? Only- but what's the timeline? Um, it depends. the The biggest crutch, uh, uh, biggest hinge is going to be when you get your survey back. So uh, again, from Which a survey, per- the topo or the, the boundary. The, the the well, typically the topo, the topo and the boundary happen at the same time. Okay. So it depends on uh, you know which survey co- which survey company you go with. We go with right now. We've been working with Terrain. The first daddy project that we went through, we got our topo boundary done, ordered and done within two weeks. But right now they're a little bit backed up. So we are about four weeks out. But I mean, literally, right? It takes somebody that long to get ready to sell. Do you know? It takes them 60, 90 days. So are you telling me that the entire process? You could get done in 90 days. Okay. You can get it done in 90 days. Guys, here's my number, 206-910-2985. This is like a business model. No shit. It's a good one too. Interesting. I mean, just making it up on the fly here, but I I have been thinking about stuff like that because I like the lending. You know how you, one of your key things is uh, make your money work for you, right? I mean, one way to do that is to be a lender, a concierge person, right? I I think the dream of most real estate individuals, professionals is to be ultimately to be a lender. Right, because lending That's to where me the ballers is are, right? true passive, hundred percent like true, true passive wealth creation, and the dollars are can be big. Exactly, you know, even micro lending. So, yeah. you know, I I I have what I call my VIP education community, where I coach other brokers. Right, there's about forty of us right now, um, and one of the things that I, you know, you have all these concierge services out there today. So my mind works like that, but they, sometimes they don't want to, they want a minimum lend or minimum engagement of let's say 15,000. Right. So you got this gap of all these homeowners, all these property owners that need 2000 to 10,000 or $15,000 worth of work. Maybe they need a roof. Maybe they need a new furnace, whatever. And there's an opportunity to be a micro lender, not a lender. That's the wrong word. It's, it's, I have all the, like I have a concierge agreement set up for myself that is available to my VIP brokers. So meaning I would assist your, your listing homeowner, because I don't want to do it on my own. And then you would assist mine. Right. And so it'd be like, let's say I paid $5,000 worth of work for that homeowner. I tie my agent to the, to the listing. It's a benefit that they get their names. You know, they have to use that listing agent. I give them 50, you know, 5,000, let's say I would get back six, could be 30 days. Yep. I mean, that is like a 20% return, you know, it's just this micro lending, right? So anybody who's 
a real estate broker that wants to, or you are in need of, of that for yourself, give me a call. But these are the whole lending aspect. Um, you could even layer that into your business, Carl, what we're, as you're coaching other people and this value add to some of these homeowners, you know, maybe what you do is, is you let them make that extra money yep. and it's some sort of deal. We're making this shit up right as we go here. You're working with a homeowner. You say, look, they want X amount of money off their deal and you want to pay 50 grand less. Maybe it's a way, or you want to pay whatever less. Maybe it's a way to say, Hey, then go I'll you know, I don't know. I'm just, I like I don't it. Know. you know where I'm going with this? I like maybe it. It's a way to end up being offering a value to end up getting a deal too. Yeah. hundred so. percent. Super awesome. This is fun today. Uh, you're not anybody, you're not looking for a, um, a, a property you can flip and move into and build a dad in the backyard for yourself. Are you? We are, I am in the middle of doing that right now on my primary. So I gotcha. will, once I finish up this dad I will be moving out probably this time next year. Remember that shoreline house we met at? Yep. So that guy, cause I ended up set listing and cause you were offering too low. Sorry, Carl. It, we get that much more, correctly. but we did get more. That guy flipped it and he got the plans pr- proved for a dadu in the backyard and tried to nice. sell it and he overpriced it by only 25 grand. I'm telling the guy, why don't you just drop your price by 25 grand? It'll sell. And he ended up keeping it as a rental. Mm. But I, if you, he, Carl and I are having a secret conversation in front of you guys across the street, kitty corner from there, I have another property right now, much nicer property that is a flip value add for somebody with a huge backyard nice. where somebody put a dadu in. So I was going to, I was going to give you that shot since, since you were the one that met me over there, but it's kitty like corner it. from the one we were at. Well, good stuff. Well, what's, what are your, what are your goals here? We're going to wrap it up with what your goals are for the next 12 months. And then also I'll say, you know, you're a community guy, you're a, uh, you know, want to help other people and how are you doing that or how can people engage with you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, goals for the next 12 months is continue on the development side. We are looking at purchasing up to 30 million, I shouldn't say up to uh, $30 million uh, of acquisitions over the next, I would actually put it at six months at this point. Pipeline is absolutely busting at the seams right now, which is fantastic. Great feeling. Our goal with these, probably I would say six, is to close out on two to three of them. And uh, that would equate to about 10 million, maybe f- maybe close to $13 million worth of project. And a lot of those are, some of those, one of them I should say is the cottage portfolio, ground up construction. Two of those are apartment covered land plays so apartments existing but it's on it's being under the land is being underutilized so we'll go in work on the entitlements and the permits to uh, maximize the potential of the of the land itself I mean add some units yeah so uh, uh, let's say it's an apartment and it is small but on a big land yeah go in there and go from uh, you know single digit apartments to 30 plus apartments plus uh, mixed uh, again. This was the mixed use uh, that I was talking about earlier. Either a sell those with entitlements in three years, or build them out. Either sell or hold them at the end of the five years. So, is that uh, in Pierce County? Or? No, that's in King. That's in Seattle. Oh, okay. I didn't know there was apartment buildings in Seattle that had extra dirt laying around. You Guess you found them. it. You right? got to dig them up. Yeah, that's that's actually a topic we've been talking about, uh, like Dion McNeely and, and my mm-hmm. Thursday crew. You should join us. You should join us sometime if you ever. I know you're busy, but 1130 is on Thursday. We talk yep. about all this kind of stuff and underwriting and all kinds of great topics, such as using underlies apartment buildings where yep. you have extra dirt to like actually start build building up. these statues and, you know, you know, yeah, goosing them up with additional units and stuff. A lot of people that's focus it. on value add of adding a unit to the basement, you know, but yeah, I mean, if you can, if you can find the apartments where there's, like you said, additional land where you can start adding on either townhomes or wrap around garden style apartments or whatever it is. And the operating asset, it can pay for the the debt service during the entitlement phase. I mean, that's the way to go. And that's what so we're looking at. When you're buying these dadu's house, existing house, and you're going to put a dadu or so in the back, are you closing it? I guess it doesn't take that long to get your dad to approve. So you don't need to worry. I remember, you know, in Crown Hill, they had these big backyards up in yep. Ballard. They have the big backyards over on the east side of sure. uh, of 15th there, right? And everybody was going back there and putting two units in the backyard. Yep. But they wanted to close in nine months. Yep. 
I'm yeah, like, they like. I mean, I, I I am absolutely in that camp of if I can if we can get developer terms. Yeah. So delayed closing, hundred percent. I'd love it's the best. You know, let me give you guys another little tip. The the investors in that situation are competing with builders, mm-hmm. right? Like, so you're a regular builder. That's their primary business forever and ever. They'd like to buy those. They want to buy just the back lot a lot of the time, and they don't want the front house. So the 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 develop the builders were going to those homeowners and saying, yeah, we'll subdivide and you can keep the front house and we'll take the back lot and give you three hundred ninety four hundred thousand dollars for the back of your backyard there. Yep. Well, they don't want to do that. So it gave an advantage, you know, last year when I was working on this to an investor where you go in and you offer the whole package that by the house they want they don't want to only sell the backyard they want to leave most of the time. Yep. And the builders didn't want to necessarily take that on. They just wanted to do the build in yep. the back. And so when you're out there, you know, you should mention that, you know, where you, it gives yourself an advantage to say, hey, I operate where I'll take the whole thing versus maybe if you're talking to builders, they're only going to want the backyard. So, right. you know, I'm going to save you some time, you know, just a pitch for you guys is what I'm saying. It may or may not work, but um how did, what are you, you coaching people? What are you up to, Carl? So I would say coaching light mentor is probably a better word, right? There's, there's a couple of folks that I work with on, uh, from entitlement, working on entitlements and permitting uh, covered land plays, as well as really identifying what's the best strategy for how you want to uh, either a, use, I guess, use your time and money, right? So uh, you, you know, this individual, these people are, you know, high income earning W2, uh, They've got a lot of cash. They don't have a lot of time, or they've got a lot of time and not so much cash. And so, just trying working with those individuals directly. It's you know probably three or four individuals right now that I'm working with. Um, so no 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 paid coaching. I don't I don't do that right yeah. now. I don't think obviously there's value in it, but you know I'm I'm looking at it more so from a a value add to the people as well as indirect value of you know how can how can I help these people and how can they help us grow as well uh, grow together. Awesome. Love that. That's how I roll. No paid coaching here, but I'll coach you. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's good stuff. I'm so happy to see you Likewise. make your rise and follow along with what you're what you're doing. Can't wait to see um see how you just blow it out of the water, right? Yeah. Maybe I'll be able to sell you something. I, I would I'd love to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, this is awesome. Carl, what if it's people want to send you a deal? Where should they send that deal to? Uh, Carl, which with a K, so K-A-R-L at Aurora's Investment Group.com. How do you spell that? Ooh, A-U-R-O-R-A-S. A-U-R-O-R Aurora A-S. There you go. Investment group.com. Investment group.com. Awesome stuff. Well, guys, this is the kind of stuff we talk about on Thursdays too. So hopefully you've enjoyed this today as much as I have. And uh, you're thinking about getting your fitness on with Get Better Project as well. And I want to remind you that every single Thursday at 1130, you can join the conversation such as this, these types of conversations we have weekly um, on our virtual meetup. That's right. It's not in person. It's virtual because I'm too lazy to go back being in person. And I'm just going to go to everybody else's in-person events. I'm the online one. Okay. And you can join us for free uh, by going to Seattle Investors Club, uh, meetup.com on Seattle Investors Club and just grab in the Zoom link. It doesn't change. Uh, It's the same link every week. So you can copy and paste that into your calendar for Thursdays at 1130 if you can join us. Um, And we give all kinds of coaching and we use our quote collective genius to help each other, help each other rise, solve each other problems, uh, celebrate each other um, and have some laughs at the same time. So come join us if if you'd like to. And um, I hope to see you there. So Joe, where can everybody find the details of today's podcast? Nice stuff, guys. Everything can be found. All the notes, all the links we talked about today at seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 162. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just head down to the description down below and I'll have the links there as well. Awesome. And please, if you enjoy this, subscribe, give us a thumbs up or whatever you do. Hit whatever button or I don't know what it is. That's is Joe's it, is department. It, is it this button Just right do here? it. Or, or is the button over here? I have no idea. 
I have no idea. Just hit it, guys. We'd appreciate it greatly. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. See you later. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.